Hello, hi everyone. Um, good evening, and welcome to uh, Wednesday Bible Study uh, by Grace Point Church. And uh, today is a new day where we are. It's actually a night where we are starting a new study through One Peter after finishing uh, through Lamentations uh, by Pastor Fidel last um, last last week. So uh, today, as you can see from your screens, uh, we have. Uh, uh, several things that we need to cover uh, but generally what we're going to do today is to have an overview of the book of one peter uh, we're going to look at an introduction to the book and then uh, at, at, we'll stop at that point and we're going to read through the book and part of the reason is because as you can see from our presentation there it is a letter and uh, i don't know what comes to your mind when you think about a letter uh, but generally, when we think about letters, uh, we want to be um, people who actually read the letters through so that we know what the message of the letters is. Uh, so basically, that's what we're going to be doing today. Um, we're going to read through the letter. And then we're going to look at the key themes in the book, things that come out from the book. Uh, we might not say everything, but just the key things that we need to remember as we go through the book. We'll have a conclusion and then we'll pray about it. Uh, so basically, let, let me pray as we as we begin, and then uh, I will just say one or two things, and then we read the letter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful uh, for this night that you've gathered us again. Uh, we are praying that, Lord, you may uh, be able to speak to us through this gathering of your people. Uh, we pray that, Lord, will hear your word, uh, that inspired word from the Holy Spirit of God. May you, Lord, apply it in our own hearts and minds. Uh, we pray for transformation as we begin this study through 1 Peter. We pray that, God, our minds shall be convicted, our hearts shall be convinced that indeed we have a living hope in Christ Jesus. So please be with each and every one of us. Speak to us, O oh God, through this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, as a way of beginning, I would like to uh, think us to think about, um, you know, the introduction to this book. And uh, when you think about um, you know, books of the Bible. Of course, you have thought about or you have heard about the different types of writings in the Bible. And this is one of the books where we can say that it is a letter or an epistle uh, that was written uh, by one Peter, who was an apostle. He's also a fisherman uh, and also uh, the one we know that denied Jesus Christ. And um, of course, we know a lot of things uh, about, about that story. Uh, but of course, we were going to look at Peter the man uh, later on after reading and the transformation that happens to him before the cross of Christ Jesus and after the cross of Christ Jesus, especially when we get to the book of Acts. But it, generally, it's a letter. And I think one of the things I would like to emphasize there is when we receive letters, generally, we want to read from the beginning uh, to the end. You don't just jump in the middle. You start from the beginning and up to the end. And that's what we're going to do today. And possibly at the end of the book, when we finish this Bible study, we are also going to uh, read again from the beginning to the end, to hear the flow uh, once more. And who is Peter writing to? Uh, Peter is writing to believers. Uh, when you begin, when you look at uh, chapter one, verse one, he's talking about believers who are scattered and are in exile. Um, in other words, these are Christians who have come to faith but one thing has led to them dispersing, and you're going to look at that, is the whole issue of suffering and persecution during the period that actually, uh, you know, he, Peter is writing uh, to these believers. So they are in different parts of Asia Minor, or what we could currently call um, uh, modern, day, modern day Turkey, and they are ri running away from the persecution that is happening at that time. Um, of course, when you read the letter, you have this sense in which Peter is writing to different people within that context. So you get an idea where they might be Jews and some might be Gentiles. And then you also have this idea of he's writing to husbands and wives. So within that uh, community of people that he's writing to, of course, he's acknowledging that they are husbands and wives. Uh, they are slaves, meaning they are working for someone else. They have a master. Uh, then he's also talking about young men uh, in chapter five. Uh, probably assuming that the people who are going to hear the letter that is read, uh, read to them, amongst them will be younger men. And then you have church elders. So the people, again, who are going to hear this letter will be church elders. And also, uh, in chapter three, you have this whole idea of uh, what is true beauty. And he's talking about women 
uh, and, and maybe looking at the context then, they were affluent women who are actually thinking true beauty comes from external things that they adorn on. And so we can also say there were affluent people within the people that uh, Peter is writing to and who are asking these questions. So as you can see from there, it's a mixture of audience. And I think I thought about it and, and, and um, you know, something came to mind. It's, 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 it's what our church is today. It's full of different people. And, and what we have in this letter is how then the gospel speaks to all these different categories of people and how the application of the gospel and the changed life that we have in Christ Jesus are actually cutting across. And when was it written? Uh, it's written within a period uh, between the period of 60 to 68 year um, AD. Um, and um, I, I went, of course, some people who have an issue with the timings, but I think we want to focus on that. And probably one of the reason is it's written when Christians had just started, uh, you know, um, uh, get going through the persecution and the suffering because of the change of emperors uh, and stuff around that. And, and later on, as you can see, the photo I put there is a photo of one Emperor Nero, uh, who was ruling around this time. Um, of course, later on, we are going to uh, see some of the themes that come with that persecution uh, to, to, to the Christians. Now, to these kind of people who are going through persecution, who are having suffering uh, as they live their Christian life, what is the one thing or several things you can sp uh, speak to them about if you are going to speak to these people? And if you think about it in our context is to, uh, to ask ourselves, um, when people are, in, are going through hardships and when people are going through suffering, what is the message that we give to them through their suffering? And what you're going to see in this letter is how then does Peter uh, think is the most important thing he can speak to believers who are going through suffering and hardship? And what is the most important one or two things? Uh, and we're going to see that a lot that keeps on coming up over and over again. And I hope that he can give to them within that context of suffering. So um, we're going to stop there for a moment and then we're going to read uh, through the letter here uh, the flow of the book, and then we're going to come back and look at one or two more other things and then go to the theme. Uh, so we'll have several people who'll be reading for us. We have Miriam who'll be uh, reading chapter one, Patrick who'll be reading uh, Mukenga, Patrick Mukenga reading chapter two, Caroline Mogito uh, will read chapter three, Eugenio Mukala chapter four, and Pastor Bernard will read chapter five. So we can hear them as they read and also follow up if you can, please. Uh, if you are able to do that, you can follow us as we read through. Uh, it will be very helpful. Note the main things, the main words that come along, and then we're going to look at that in the main themes. Uh, so over to you, Miriam. Yeah, let's read from Juan Peter. This is Patrick, not Miriam. So we read Juan Peter, reading from ESV. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being gathered through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than God that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and in glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace ought to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person all time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and subsequent glories. 
it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which ages long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but he who called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, according to each one's deed, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the futile way, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He who was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you, whom, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for sincerely brotherly love, love one another honestly from my pure hearts, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. And we continue to read chapter 2. And this is what it says, chapter 2, of 1 Peter. So put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tested that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you... you food to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, for it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Verse 7, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builder rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled because they did not obey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wages which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the gentle honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governor as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish folk. Leave us people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your master with all respect, not only to the, to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When, 
mindful of God. One endures sorrow, sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you do good, but if you if you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wound you have been healed, for you are straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Chapter 3 Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if uh, some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word, by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let, uh, do not uh, do not obey the word. They may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and putting on uh, of gold jewelry by the clothing of you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with an imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Verse 5. For this is how the holy woman who op- uh, hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, called him Lord, and you are her children if you do, not, uh, if you do good and do not fear anything that is uh, frightening. Likewise, Husbands, live with your wife in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, since they are the heirs with, uh, with you at the, of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, uh, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or uh, revealing uh, re- for revealing, but on the contrary, bless for, bless for to this you are called, and that you, may obey, uh, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and sees good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Verse 13. Now, who is there to, uh, to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for, righteous, for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your heart, honor Christ and the Lord, uh, Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile uh, your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for, for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous, of the, uh, uh, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirit in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience, uh, patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, that is eight, uh, eight persons, were bro- brought safely through water, uh, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a remover, removal of that from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven 
and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and power, powers having been subjected to him. Chapter 4. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past service for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, we are surprised when they do not join when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead. The thought judge in the first, the way people are, they might live in the spirit, the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. About loving one another, since love covers a multitude, use it to serve one another as good steward of God's valid grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in a sofa as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon him. But let no one suffer as a mantler, or a thief, or an evildoer, or a meddler. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the Elisha discuss this said, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will and trust their soul to a faithful creator for they are doing good. Yeah. Chapter 5, and I read from the ESV. So I exhort the elders among you, as fellow elders and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that in the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will him himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. See who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. 
And that's the word of the Lord. Uh, thank you, everyone who has read for us. Um, it's a very um, passionate and emotional letter, if you think about it, and um, especially when you think it's being read in public. Uh, of course, I'm not going to tell you to greet one another at the end there, like they're saying, but you can imagine uh, what Peter is saying there. Um, we're going to look, um, quickly, I'm going to look at um, the man Peter, uh, just to give us um, a short background of where we are coming from. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier on, he was a fisherman uh, who walked, talked, and ate with Jesus. And the reason I'm doing this is because uh, sometimes when we think about Bible authors, we don't think about them as real men, uh, as people who actually existed. Uh, sometimes we may even think about them as uh, people who have come from heaven. But these are real men. He was a fisherman uh, who walked, talked, and ate with Jesus. Uh, so you can imagine our modern day fishermen uh, in Kisumu or Mombasa. Uh, he's the Peter who spent time with Jesus, recognized Jesus as the Messiah in Matthew 16. He was there at the transfiguration. And yet at the end of Matthew, he's the one who denied Jesus three times and actually wants to fight for Jesus. Uh, he's the Peter who walked on the water towards the risen Lord uh, when he appears to them, um, uh, you know, walking on water. He's the Peter who, uh, we are told, uh, segregated Jews, um, especially in Galatians, um, when they did not, uh, not segregated Gentiles uh, against the Jews because he thought they could not be Christian enough. Uh, or, uh, you know, when he thinks about the things that they are not doing that they are supposed to do according to Judaism. And at the end, he died as a martyr and he was crucified. Uh, historical books will actually say he said he is not worthy to be crucified like his Lord Jesus Christ, and he was crucified upside down in the reign of Emperor Nero. And when you go to Acts, he's the Peter who is the preacher and the leader of the Christian movement in the Acts of Apostle. And, and so one wonders what has happened to Peter that he's writing such a passionate letter, and he's actually the one encouraging believers and Christians. And there is one thing we can conclude. There is a new birth after the cross of Christ Jesus that has happened in the life and heart of Peter. There's a new birth into a living hope. And that is the message of Peter from one Peter. So if you can uh, move on to just paint a picture of what the situation was uh, to the, uh, in the time that Peter was writing this letter. And the first thing we see is that there was persecution of Christian by Emperor Nero. Now, when you go through this letter, you gather several things that shows that there was suffering and trial um, during the time Peter is writing. Uh, when you look at chapter, chapter 1, verse 6, in all, in all you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all, in all kinds of trials. So the people he is writing to, the congregation he is writing to, dispersed in the minor Asia, uh, Asia Minor, are actually going through trials of different kinds, depending on where the person is. And in chapter 3, um, there is also an encouragement not to fear threats or be frightened, but in their heart to revere Christ as Lord. Uh, and we're going to come to that later, that the danger there is when they are going through hardship and suffering and trial, the danger always is to be tempted to actually fall away from faith. But he's encouraging me not to fear threats that come because of their faith. Or in chapter four, they, they, you know, some people are surprised that they are Christians and they are going through hardships. And therefore he, say, he tells them, don't be surprised. Um, you know, um, uh, or actually when people, you, you know, when people are, are thinking, why are these people not joining us in our own wickedness or sinfulness, in recklessness, in wide living, and they heap abuse on them. That is a form of suffering or persecution that they are going through. And of course, um, not being surprised that they are going through the hardships. Now, um, at the end, I wanted us to watch a video, but later on, we realized it's, it's a little bit gory. And so we are not going to watch it. But in case you'll be interested to watch a depiction of the suffering that was happening there, I uh, will be happy to send you a link on uh, in YouTube and you can watch uh, it later. It's around seven minutes. But basically what we used to happen is they used to round up Christians and put them in an arena. You can imagine like Nyayo Stadium, well protected. They put Christians in the middle and then they open wild dogs. Uh, on, the, on the video you see it's lions, um, but I doubt whether it was li actual lions, but that time it was wild dogs. 
altar. Some people were burnt on stake because of their faith. And this is the kind of people that Peter is writing to. And he say, uh, his, his message, as we're going to see, is a message of hope. And what kind of hope is he talking about? We're going to see that. So that's the first situation we see at the time of writing Christians who are being persecuted. Now, one person uh, has try to depict what this looked like. And I have you know, uh, took, taken a photo there from the book, 2000 Years of Christ's Power. And this is what he says, uh, that is um, uh, Tacitus in AD 55, he existed in AD 55 to 117. He says to kill the rumors, uh, these were the rumors that there was a fire that uh, you know, brought down Rome and um, Nero uh, was saying he's the one who started the fire so that he could rebuild the city again. And so to kill these rumors, Nero charged and tortured some people hated for their evil practices, the group popularly known as Christians. The founder of this sect, Christ, had been put to death by the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, when Tiberius was the emperor. Their deadly superstition had been suppressed temporarily, but was beginning to spring up again, not now just in Judea, but even in Rome itself where all kinds of sordid and shameful activities are att attracted and catch on. First, the authority arrested those who confessed to being Christians. Then, on information obtained from them, the court convicted hundreds more, not so much for starting the fire as for their antisocial beliefs. In their deaths, they were made a mockery. They were covered in the skins of wild animals, torn to death by dogs, crucified or set on fire, so that when darkness fell, they burned like torches in the night. Nero opened up his own gardens for his spectacle and gave a show in the arena where he mixed with the crowd or stood dressed as a char charioteer and a chariot. As a result, although they were guilty of being Christians and deserved to die, people began to feel sorry for them for they realized that they were being killed, not for the public good, but to satisfy one man's madness. And that's someone describing the persecution that they were going through. So that's one of the situations that we see. Um, the, the other bit that we see in this time that uh, Peter is writing is persecution led to scattering of people in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, I think we have mentioned about that. Believers were discouraged and tempted to give up on their faith. Uh, so there's that temptation. Should we continue being Christian? Should we continue living Christian life? Should we suspend uh, Christian living because we are going through hardship? And then there is uh, living a Christian life in the midst of suffering and persecution was very difficult uh, during that time. And these are the people that Peter is writing to. So what are the major themes that uh, come out of, from this book? And the first thing we see, which is a big one in this book, is Christian identity in new birth. And Peter begins this letter by um, uh, urging believers that he's writing to, to remember they are about their Christian birth. And this Christian birth is into a living hope. And what Peter is trying to tell them is, think about the situation you're in. Do you think it will ever end? And I think uh, he makes a very passionate appeal, and we're going to see that next week, that for us to go through hardship, for them to go through the hardship, and even for us to go through hardship, we need hope. But the question is, what kind of hope? And of course, he gives them, he tells them that you have a new Christian identity in the new birth that has been achieved through the Trinity and in Christ Jesus, who is part of the Trinity. So he's talking about the present grace, past grace, and future grace, which is all summed up in this whole idea of hope. That for us to face trials today and go through hardship today, we must not lose sight of our identity and of course of the hope we have that one day everything will come to an end. And you're going to read a verse from Malachi at the end, which actually talks about that, the future hope that we have uh, in, in, the, in the identity that we have in Christ. Of course, in chapter 2, he talks about a spiritual house and a royal priesthood for his obedience. So God desires a people for his own obedience. So the reason we are Christian is for God's own obedience so that we may obey him. And of course, the idea that uh, saving grace is enduring grace. So in other words, when hardships come, we endure through hardship. And so it can raise the question then, how do we endure hard times? And the question, the, the answer will be the hope that we have. And then it brings out the whole issue of respect and submission 
it's an identity or grace issue. So someone can ask then, why does he talk about husband and wives uh, later on um, uh, in chapter three? And what he's saying here is, the danger is to think, oh, we are going through hardship. Let's suspend Christian living and live life the way we want. But actually say, no, even in the midst of suffering, Christian living is not suspended. We must continue to live as those who have an identity and, and you know, are followers of Christ Jesus. Even serving itself is an identity issue. If we don't understand why we are serving and we don't see the, the example of Christ Jesus and how he has saved us first and caused us to follow him, we will not be able to serve if our hearts are not clear on that identity. And then, of course, God's grace is for those who are humble. And at the end of chapter 5, is a call um, and a conclusion that we need to stand firm in this grace that God has called us into. Um, the second major theme that we see in this book, uh, I'm rushing because of time, is the call to holy living. So we have a Christian identity. Um, we have a new birth in Christ Jesus. Then the question is, for what purpose? And the answer is for holy living. If you actually look at um, chapter 1, verse 1, at the end there, it says that, um, um, end of chapter 2, uh, or actually let's begin at chapter 2, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. So the reason we are being saved is for obedience to God or obedience uh, and following God himself. And this is a big question to believers in exile. How can we say we are believers and yet, uh, you know, we are supposed to go through this hardship and still obey God? And that's a quick, huge question that I've, I've raised there. Should we suspend Christian living uh, because of suffering? And of course, in times of suffering, there's a danger of living recklessly and suspending God's word. So you say, oh, it's a hard time. Like we are facing Corona issue now. So people can do whatever they want. You know, we can live recklessly, but no, Christian living is not suspended because of that. Uh, and of course, the call to holy living takes different forms in the letter. So you have relationship with God, um, you know, how we have been saved in the word. We need to dwell in the word and continue uh, craving the word of God. Of course, interpersonal relationship, submission to secular authorities. We're going to see a, that's a big issue there. Husband and wife, employee and employer elders and younger men, and many other ways that this letter calls us to holy living. Uh, the second major theme or message of this uh, let, uh, letter, the third one is believers and suffering. And I, I've looked at it these two uh, major ways. One is believers who suffer. And this letter, if you had it read, the word suffering appears over and over again. And the question is, do followers of Christ through, go through hardship? And of course, lamentation showed us we do. But of course, we know, you also know that many people don't believe that believers go through hardships. And the thing I thought is God's elect, people who God calls for himself in exile, are actually facing persecution. And it almost seems like he's actually calling them to go through the hardship. But why are they going through the hardship? Because they are set apart. The world cannot, um, the world does not accept them. So they go through insults, you know, ridicule and suffering for their good deed. They want to live Christian lives, but because they are living Christian lives, the world does not agree to it, so they will be, there will be hardship. And of course, the next bit of this suffering is, suffering can be a witness. Uh, you know, when we suffer well as Christian, it can be a witness to many others who are watching us. So it proves genuineness of our faith uh, in chapter one, verse six to seven, chapter two, uh, though we might be accused, they see our good deeds and glorify God uh, through that hardship. And then it also, enduring suffering is commendable before God when you're going through this hardship. In chapter 3, unbelieving husbands can be won over through submitted wives, uh, lives of their wives. So there's a question there that actually suffering well can actually be a witness to many people who are around us. And maybe we can think about that for a moment and think, um, you know, how are we living in this time that are, we are having hardship? Uh, whatever challenging bit that we may be going through is to think, am I suffering well? Am I becoming a witness and a follower of Christ even in the hardship, whether it's no work uh, or no job or no income, whatever it might be, am I suffering well? And is my faith, is, is this suffering proving the genuineness of, of my faith? 
And that's a big question. Uh, someone told me once that uh, every time Christ, people become believers, he wants to ask them, what is the one thing that God is calling them to stop doing? Uh, because he says, if you're, you're not leaving the world, um, you know, living means, uh, you know, kutoka, if you're not leaving the world, uh, then there's something a little bit off about our faith and our, 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 our salvation. The fourth thing we can see uh, from this bit is um, um, the Trinity and our salvation. I found it interesting how the Trinity, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ are involved in our salvation in different ways. And of course, later on, chapter, uh, in verse 11 of chapter 1, the Holy Spirit is, an, is the one who has inspired uh, you know, the, the prophets to write the words that we can even read today, uh, but above all, continuously encourages us in our faith. So there's that bit about the Trinity and our salvation, which is a very helpful thing to think about, now that we don't think a lot about the Trinity and how the Trinity is involved in our own salvation. And then the Church of Christ, uh, and several things I, I, I put down here, uh, the, the Church of Christ is a spiritual house for spiritual sacrifices by spiritual priests. Uh, so that's in chapter 2, uh, verse 5 uh, to around 9. And then church exists to declare praise of God, chapter 2, verse 10, uh, conduct of elders in a church setting, conduct of younger men towards their elders in a church setting. So there's that theme that will keep on coming back. How do you, for people that he's writing to, when the letter is being read uh, in, the, in, the, in the public, how do the people within that congregation uh, relate with one another? And how, um, you know, Peter you know, portrays the church vis-a-vis uh, -vis the different uh, aspect of, of the Church of Christ. So those are the uh, major themes uh, and the main themes that we see uh, from this uh, letter. And um, in terms of conclusion, as we think about this, is, is to come to this whole idea from the letter that we are disciples in exile. Uh, a name that I found from a document that I had uh, a while back is exilic discipleship. And maybe we need to think about this idea a little bit more because we need to see ourselves as people who are called out from the world, yet still in the world, and we are called to live and follow Christ in the world. Now, that will look very different, um, you know, for different things, whether it's at family level, at work level, friendships, business, um, you know, and whatever aspect it is. And I thought this is a very helpful thing because maybe we need to spend a little bit more time thinking how do i live as a christian in many facets of my own life and of late i've been thinking a lot about family and sometimes the danger is to think that our own families uh um, you know we always follow god or the you know uh the, everyone there will always be following god but actually when we are living in those families we are actually God's representatives and followers of God in that context. And we are called to live in that context as believers uh, in exile. And we've got to think about it more because, because we are called to be holy and live differently, we need to continuously be speaking the truth in those contexts. Uh, and when suffering comes, whether it's in terms of insults or um, uh, people you know, ridiculing us because we are Christians, uh, whether it's our workplaces or friendships or the way we are doing our business is very different. We might suffer uh, losses or even lack of business because we probably don't want to give kickbacks and stuff like that. And therefore, we need to keep on thinking about this whole uh, idea about disciples in exile. That the world is hostile. It rejected Jesus Christ himself. Uh, I think when we try to be accepted too much by the world, then there might be a problem there. And that they, what this letter will call us is to think we have a holy calling. Uh, a holy means here that we are called out from the world, uh, but yet still in the world. And in the midst of suffering, we shouldn't forget our identity in Jesus Christ, our salvation and our priesthood. Uh, that we are, um, you know, um, our salvation means uh, we are spiritual house that is offering spiritual sacrifices because we are spiritual priests. Uh, we, we, we like that verse in chapter 2. A royal priesthood was their purpose to offer spiritual sacrifices uh, because they belong to God. And this gives, when we keep on remembering this identity, uh, it gives us strength to stand firm in times of suffering. 
so that the idea of our future hope, when we think that one day all this will end, then it gives us strength and hope to actually live today those who have a future hope. Now, this hope is not like oh, the comparison given in the letter is between gold. And he actually says, even gold perishes. Now, you think about it. The, the analogy there is very strong. Gold perishes, not even money. Gold, it perishes. Silver perishes. But you know what? The hope we have in Christ Jesus is eternal, you know. Uh, and I found that that's very encouraging. And it's eternal. It's, it's the hope we cling to, to go through hardship uh, today. And it's this hope and the grace that has been revealed to us. At the end of the letter, Peter will say, we are called to stand firm in this grace. So when hardship comes left, right, and center, we are called to stand firm uh, in that grace. So what is the encouragement to the people going through hardship, suffering, and persecution that Peter is writing to? Is to look and focus on this future hope, the new birth they have in Christ Jesus, and that one day when Christ uh, is revealed or returns, everything will be set uh, righteous and right. And that's a great thing because then we can see all injustices that will not be dealt with on this side of the world, one day they will be dealt with. In Malachi writing this uh, in chapter 4 of Malachi verse 1 and 2 says, as we conclude, surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and evildoer will be will be stubble in that in that and that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed cows. And, and that always an encouragement uh, for me, and I hope it's an encouragement for you. You think about a well-fed calf. If for you, those who have reared calves, uh, you know, when it's fully full with milk and you release it, uh, you know, it keeps going round and round because it's well-fed. And that's the future hope that we have that one day, uh, you know, everything, the son of rashness will come and will set everything right uh, and will bring healing uh, for us. So we are going to stop there uh, because of time, but uh, we're looking forward uh, to... we can continuously apply this letter in our own lives. So I will pray and then I will come um, uh, questions, if there will be any questions, and then we'll listen to the last song and then we, uh, we, are, we come to an end. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please do help us as we uh, think and read through this letter, as we go through this letter. Uh, in the next coming weeks, we pray that God, you will guide us and lead us. We pray uh, that Father, you open our mind to understanding and our hearts, Lord, to understanding uh, that, Lord, we will see this amazing new birth we have in Christ Jesus, uh, this hope, eternal hope, that continuously uh, uh, you know, reminds us and gives us strength uh, for each and every passing day in hardships, in times of suffering, and gives us strength even to live Christian lives um, in a time when, Lord, uh, sometimes might be hard. We pray for strength in the power of your Holy Spirit, that each and every one of us, Lord, uh, will be strengthened to uh, live Christian lives in every aspect uh, that, Lord, you have given them or called them uh, for such a time as this. So we are grateful and we look forward, Lord, uh, to amazing time in the next few weeks as we go through this letter. For this we pray, trusting and believing in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Um, I, I know our time is uh, a little bit spent. Uh, maybe we can, unless there's any burning questions or question, maybe one, and then... Um, we can hear to the la we can hear last song, and uh, uh, yeah, we call it a, a study. Uh, great! Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us, um, and we look forward to having you next week uh, from eight um, to nine as we look at verse one uh, to verse twelve uh, of chapter one. Uh, so karibuni sana, and um, remember we are disciples in exile. Uh, feel free to leave. Um, yeah, and we are grateful. Thank you.